Hello, I'm Jonathan Mast. Welcome back to the Wellness Center as part of our uh, Sedgwick Virtual Rims Week. And our speaker now is Dr. Rima Hamoud. And uh, welcome, Rima. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Jonathan? I'm great. Thanks for being with us and talking about this important uh, topic, avoiding prescription drugs and its consequences. We, we know this continues to be a, a really a strong thing that Sedgwick's focusing on and continues to be an issue across the country. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me this morning. Um, so let's get right to it. Let's talk about avoiding prescription drugs and their unintended consequences. So prescription medications are prescribed for patients when deemed appropriate by their physicians. It is imperative to note that these medications are still foreign chemicals or poisons with beneficial effects. As with any medication, the dosage, formulation, active and inactive ingredients, along with the pharmacokinetic properties must be taken into consideration when prescribing a drug to the patient. We hope that physician and pharmacists perform their due diligence when prescribing and dispensing medications. But ultimately, it falls under the patient's responsibility to ask questions and confirm understanding of the appropriate use of the prescribed medication. For many decades, Americans have been battling the opioid epidemic. With some of the numbers still trending upwards, we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to level off overall. In 2018, there was over 67,000 deaths by overdose in US, which is in fact a 4.1% decline, decline from 2017. In 2017, the number was 70,237 deaths. So although the rate of drug overdose deaths decreased overall, deaths involving synthetic opioid overdose, such as fentanyl, fentanyl analog, um, you might be familiar with carfentanyl, um, or tramadol increased by 10% from 2017 to 2018. So the synthetic opioids increased, although the other opioids decreased from previous year. We all are quite familiar with the side effects related to opioids, such as dizziness, drowsiness, um, respiratory side effects with difficulty breathing. In the medical world, we're familiar with the cardiovascular risk factors as well, um, and the hormone imbalance that is caused by opioids. What's emerging from new research is the risk of hypogonadism. What that means is a change in the level of estrogen and testosterone, the sex hormone. Earlier this year, the American Academy of Pain Medicine reported that men receiving chronic long-acting opiate therapy had nearly 1.5% fold increase risk of developing hypogonadism. This study also showed that hypogonadism to be a dose-related effect. So every 100 morphine equivalent daily dose increase, there was a 44% increase in risk of developing hypogonadism. So now let's step back and understand what morphine equivalent dose mean, or MED. So morphine is our gold standard. Any other opioid is, when prescribed is always compared to morphine. So if a physician is prescribing oxycodone, they want to see how it is in comparison to morphine. So 20 milligram of oxycodone is, uh, is 30 milligrams of morphine. So that means oxycodone is more potent than morphine. 20 milligrams of hydrocodone is 20 milligrams of morphine. So they're one to one. So when prescribers are prescribing a prescription to a patient, they calculate that morphine equivalent dose. Patients receiving a more than 90 milligram of morphine equivalent dose or MED, they experience nearly a nine-fold increase in overdose risk compared to patients taking only 20 milligram of morphine equivalent dose. And what's important to understand is oftentimes the prescriber only calculates the MED of that one drug that they're prescribing and not look at it from a holistic point of view. Um, they don't really see if the patient is taking multiple opioids. Is there a combination of short-acting opioid and a long-acting opioid? Is the take, patient taking any opioid that tend to accumulate in the body and that they may result in an elevated MED? Such as the case of methadone and buprenorphine, 
what is mathematically calculated may be incorrect due to the dose accumulation. We also want to see is the medication interacting with other medications. We may find that the concentration of opioids will increase or decrease due to the metabolism of other medications, which lead to a slew of additional questions, such as is the drug competing with liver enzymes to be metabolized? Is the patient elderly with aging kidney? Therefore, what is the effect of the drug distribution in the body? So these are just a few of the questions clinicians need to be asking prior to prescribing an opioid, not just initially, but with every subsequent visit. Increasing dosage without the careful evaluation of symptoms and pain management could lead to something called hyperalgesia, which is a painful stimuli of receptors. So opioids bind to receptors, and that's how we get that analgesic effect, but hyperstimulation of those um, receptors could lead to more pain versus getting pain relief. At doses of 15 MED and over, it is recommended that reassessment of the use of this class of drugs should be made due to the limited evidence of improved pain control and function. And with continued use, there is evidence of substantial adverse events associated with higher MED use. So when opioid is prescribed, we don't want to just look at one single opioid that's being prescribed. We want to look at the patient's whole profile and see if there are any other opioids that are being prescribed or other medications that interact with that opioid. The next class I'm going to talk about is gabapentinoids, such as pregabalin or gabapentin. You might be familiar with Lyrica. FDA approved these medications for partial seizures and post-herpatic neuralgia. Additionally, Pregabalin, or Lyrica, carries an indication for the treatment of neuropathic pain associated with spinal cord injury. Over recent years, the popularity of these drugs outside their indication have increased, perhaps due to the known fact that they may increase the euphoric effect of opioids. This past December, FDA issued a warning about the potentially serious breathing difficulties in patients using gabapentin or pregabalin who have risk factors. It could be a risk factor of an age, or the risk factor could be patients using other medications such as opioids, or patients have COPD or other lung disorder that can increase the risk of respiratory depression with these medications. And the same year, the British Medical Journal found pa that patients taking pregabalin to be an increased risk of traffic accidents and offenses, unintentional overdose, head and body injuries, suicidal behavior, and deaths from suicide. If that doesn't scare you about this drug, I don't know what it would. Our next drug is tramadol, which some physicians argue that it's not a true opioid and it has a much safer side effect profile. But really, in fact, it is an opioid and has other pharmacological properties, which may lead to a lot of side effects. So it causes respiratory depression, just like opioids, but it also causes hypoglycemia, which is lowering of blood sugar. It causes GI side effects, such as constipation, just like opioids, but can also cause seizures or lower the seizure threshold, even if patient doesn't have an underlying seizure disorder. So many guidelines, such as ODG and ACOM, do not recommend the use of tramadol. They want patients to try NSAID uh, drugs, such as Motrin or ibuprofen or Aleve, for the treatment of lower back pain and osteoarthritis before trying an opioid or a tramadol. Earlier this year, um, a journal of bone and mineral research analyzed the safety of tramadol against NSAID and opioids such as codeine. The tramadol group had a significant increase in emergency room visits, falls and hip fractures, cardiovascular events, and all-cause mortality when it was compared to NSAID such as Motrin, naproxen, and even Celebrex. This tramadol group then, then it was compared to opioid, to codeine, and it still had higher risk of falls and fractures when compared to um, codeine. So it really shows you that even though the medication might seem safe and tramadol does have a low MED, but because the way the structure of tramadol is, it has a lot of side effects, which we need to be aware of. 
often time in our industry, we see um, opioids prescribed for an injured worker, but along with opioids, we also see sleeping aids, which may be prescribed early on in the therapy to cope with pain and also decrease insomnia. These drugs are only recommended for four weeks or less because anything beyond that will lose its efficacy and increase risk of dependence. FDA issued a black box warning for a class of drugs called Z drugs, so Zolpidem, Zelplon, and s -Blocon. And you might be familiar with Zolpidem, the brand name of that is Ambien. So FDA stated that they were linked to serious injuries, including death. And these drugs already contain really funny side effects. It has abnormal sleep behavior, such as sleepwalking, sleep driving, engaging in other activities, while not fully awake. So these drugs are not recommended beyond four weeks. So we want to be very careful when looking at patient's profile. The last class of drug I'm going to talk about might seem a little interesting that I'm even addressing it um, right now um, is antacids. We think of antacids as very safe medications, often used for ulcer or difficulty digesting food. Um, they're considered relatively safe because most of these drugs are over-the-counter medications. Drugs like omeprazole, which is Prilosec, um, or Pravacid, are often prescribed for GI side effects. And they're especially prescribed when somebody's on an NSAID to combat the side effect of an NSAID. And when I say NSAID, like I mentioned earlier, it's Motrin or Celebrex. These drugs, um, omeprazole or Pravacid, may also be prescribed during the acute hospital stay to help with the reflux. But the chronic use of these medications is not recommended due to, due to the serious risk of bone loss and fractures and their ability to cause hypomagnesemia, which is low magnesium in the body and vitamin B12 deficiency. Such adverse events could be so threatening in elderly population that these drugs were listed in Beer's criteria in 2015. So let's step back and talk what Beer's criteria is. Um, Beer's criteria is a list of drugs that was created by Dr. Beer's, so he named it after himself. And it has a list of medications that are not recommended in elderly above the age of 65. And the reason for that is because it can cause a lot of side effects in the elderly, which a younger person might not experience because of delayed metabolism in the body, aging body, um, the difficulty in excre excreting these medications or aging kidneys and liver. So elderly population might experience more dizziness or drowsiness. Oftentimes they have a high risk of fa fractures and falls with these medications or even delirium. So these medications, it's a list of drugs that are not recommended in elderly. And proton pump inhibitors, which is Prilosec and Prevacid, they were added to that list because they did have that concerning side effects in elderly. PPIs or proton pump inhibitors are also associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and risk of MI within general population, regardless of their underlying disease status. So that's another thing with clinicians need to be monitoring in patients. And we really need to reevaluate the therapy or the use of PPIs beyond eight weeks. The recommended um, duration of therapy with these drugs is only eight weeks because there is diminished efficacy, there's more risk of side effects, and longer than eight weeks is not recommended. So we wanna always question it when we see this for a long period of time in patient's profile. We talked about opioids, gabapentinoids, Z drugs, PPIs, all of these drugs are FDA approved, and their use is recommended by multiple guidelines. But these recommendations are, are for very specific conditions, and they're only indicated for a very specific period of time. Prolonged use or misuse can lead to dangerous and unwanted, unintentional side effects. Clinicians have the responsibility to do their due diligence when prescribing such medications. Recently, that is emerging regarding the use and effectiveness of complementary integrative therapy or non-pharmacologic pain treatment to address opioid use. 
the American College of Physicians recommend non-pharmacologic treatment first prior to utilizing opioids for back pain. So when I say non-pharmacologic treatments, think of your acupuncture, tai chi, chiropractic care, physical therapy, and mindful breathing, or even yoga. All these therapies have shown promising results when utilized early on for the management of pain, as well as as adjunct therapy for behavioral health. We're learning that in addition to improvement of pain scores, we need to view the patient from a holistic perspective and really focus on overall functional improvement for the patient, not just on their little pain score. When we, when we look at their medication treatment, we wanna look at their psychosocial aspect also and look at how these medications are interacting with each other, how the patient's body is reacting to these medications. Is the patient even ready to take this medication? Does the patient have other tools to cope with pain, to cope with sleep, and the other issues that they might be experiencing? We need to address all those questions and reevaluate therapy really on every single visit instead of having somebody on the same medication for decades. So that's all I got, Jonathan. Do you have any questions for me? Do the audience have any questions for me? Well, when you say that's all you got, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's kind of the, the first question is just, there's so much and it changes so, so fast. So as, you know, as an employer, where, where can we turn to know that we're getting, you know, working with physicians who are, taking this good approach or, or, you know, what is Sedgwick seeing from that angle? So at Sedgwick, we have our own clinical department. So we have utilization review and complex pharmacy management, which includes physicians, pharmacists, and nurses. We not only look at patient's fill history, but also see what patient is getting as personal medication, what are patient's comorbidities, are these medications working well for the patient over a period of time? Um, whether patient is you know, filling them or not, we wanna see what's working for them. And then we contact the provider. We wanna make sure patient is getting the best in class care for, um, for their medical treatment. And then we also contact the patient and discuss the therapy to see if they're experiencing any side effects. Is the medication really working for them? Our nurses perform pain coaching, so it's really holding hands, holding patients' hands through this process to see if the medications are working for them or not, if we need to adjust the treatment, how to cope with pain, how to do mindful breathing, and our nurses are educating the patients to do, do that. And our pharmacists perform medication therapy management, which is counseling the patient on the medications that they are taking. Are they experiencing any side effects? Are they taking any unwanted medications? Are the medications really working for them? Do we need to adjust the treatment and talk to the provider about it? So we wanna be patient's advocate in this process and work as collaboratively with the provider, with the claims team and the clinical team. When you talk about alternatives such as yoga, physical therapy, uh, other medications, what, what type of uh, a turnaround or time frame can, can would he expect if somebody has to make a transition from maybe being prescribed a drug to this less or this more holistic approach, if, if that makes sense? So yoga and mindful breathing or physical therapy they each have a different approach. So if you're taking from, if you're talking from physical therapy perspective, we want it early on in the treatment. And we want to make sure a patient has a good pain coverage so they can perform physical therapy, really push, it, push their body and get the muscles and the joints moving again. So if we get the physical therapy early on after the injury, you see more beneficial effects. And it's usually three to four months and I mean, it takes a body about a year to get back to its you know, baseline, but a good physical therapy for three to four months can get the body moving back, whether it's a back pain or joint pain or back injury, whatever it is. Yoga or mindful breathing, on the other hand, or even Tai Chi 
could be utilized even later on. So even if somebody's using opioids chronically, they could utilize this complementary integrative medicine. And it helps, it gives them um, more control of their body, really listening to them, like how the body is reacting and how to control their pain. So the way mindful breathing works, for example, is if somebody is experiencing pain, the thought is to just help calm your body, take deep, take deep breaths, and try to focus on breathing so your mind is not focusing on pain. So it's making your mind think that you know, your, the breath is more important. You're taking the focus away from pain. And if you do that over and over, you're teaching your mind how to think differently. So such practices could be used later on and they're very effective. And once patients starts using it, it really becomes a lifestyle. Great. Well, definitely more information that people want to know and we'll try to collect everyone's questions, uh, follow up later with a blog or some other resource from, from Dr. Hamoud. And thank you for uh, all the great information. Uh, we remind you again, uh, part of the Sedgwick Virtual Rims Week. Look around the uh, virtual landing page and other great sessions uh, coming up. And so uh, thank you for being with us and for sharing today. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.